447. Creature blessed, and in our hearts take up thy rest. Now do thy grace and heavenly aid to fill the hearts which thou hast made. To fill the hearts which thou hast made. O comforter, to thee we cry. O from God on high, as him for life. And fire of love and sweet anointing from above, and sweet anointing from above. Readers, do we have any readers? You want to come come read? Okay, that'll be great. I'll, I'll let you know in just a second. So right there, we'll start mass. I'll talk a little about this um, during the homily. I'll do a little in, intro to it anyway. But uh, we'll be celebrating mass here in the here in the chapel. Um, it's called Adiorntim, so it's basically celebrating. Tr- Towards to together, leading, I'm leading you in worship of the Father and offering Jesus to the Father. Okay, so we, we're not, I'm not turning away from you, but I'm turning with you as the priest, the head of the body, um, the, the head of the mystical body of Christ. I will leading you in prayer and offering Jesus to the Father. And that's what we'll be doing. So I'll just ask you to, to listen to the words. Um, so, um, and because they take on a different meaning when I turn around, it's, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about though. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, so we prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God, and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts, in my words, what I have done, what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. May the virgin martyr, St. Agatha, implore your compassion for us, O Lord, we pray. For she found favor with you by the courage of her martyrdom and the merit of her chastity. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect hospitality, for through it some have unknowingly entertained angels. Be mindful of prisoners as if sharing their imprisonment, and of the ill-treated as of yourselves, for you also are in the body. Let marriage be honored among all, and the marriage bed be kept undefiled. For God will judge the immoral and adulterers. Let your life be free from love of money, but be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never forsake you or abandon you. Thus, we may say with confidence, the Lord is my helper and I will not be afraid. What can anyone do to me? 
Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Beautiful. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? The Lord is my life's refuge. Of whom should I be afraid? The Lord is my light and my salvation. Though an army encamp against me, my heart will not fear. Though war be waged upon me, even then will I trust. The Lord is my light and my salvation. For he will hide me in his abode in the day of trouble. He will conceal me in the shelter of his tent. He will set me high upon a rock. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Your presence, O Lord, I seek. Hide not your face from me. Do not in anger repel your servant. You are my helper. Cast me not off. The Lord is my Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Blessed are they who have kept the word with a generous heart and yield a harvest through perseverance. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. King Herod heard about Jesus, for his fame had become widespread, and people were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why mighty powers are at work in him. Others were saying, he is Elijah. Still others, he is a prophet like any of the prophets. But when Herod heard of it, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised up. Herod was, one, was the one who had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, whom he had married. John had said to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias harbored a grudge against him and wanted to kill him, but was unable to do so. Herod feared John, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man, and kept him in custody. When he heard him speak, he was very much perplexed, yet he liked to listen to him. Herodias had an opportunity one day when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers, his military officers, and the leading men of Galilee. His own daughter came in and performed a dance that delighted Herod and his guests. The king said to the girl, Ask of me whatever you wish, and I will grant it to you. He even swore many things to her. He will grant you whatever you ask of him. Even I will grant you whatever you ask of me, even to half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What shall I ask for? Her mother replied, The head of John the Baptist. The girl hurried back to the king's presence and made her request, I want you to give me at once on a platter the head of John the Baptist. The king was deeply distressed, but because of his oaths, oaths and the guests, he did not wish to break his word to her. So he promptly dispatched an executioner with orders to bring back his head. He went off and beheaded him in the prison. He brought, back in, the head, he brought in the head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl in turn gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. First, the good news and the bad news. The good news is you're here. We've begun. We're, it's all working. It's going. You made it in before the blizzard. That's the really good news. Um, and so we don't have an open fireplace or anything, but we'll have the fire of the Holy Spirit. And that's a great thing to hope. So we have, a, we have a greater fire. Uh, the bad news is I talk really fast. And so I have to apologize for that up front. 
Um, I'll try to slow down. I try to slow down, especially during mass. So if I do sound like I'm going slower here, that's because I'm really trying hard. Um, but that's, that's uh, one of my weaknesses, I guess. Um, um, but it, it is a, a real sense of, I guess, my joy also coming out that I, I want to share with you as much as I possibly can um, to give you as much as I can. But it does, it is kind of hard to understand sometimes. So I will try, you can wait, I need a red flag or something. We'll talk about that. You'll hear about that in one of the, one of the, uh, t- one of the, um, um, uh, the, the recordings we'll have during meals. Um, during meals, there will be recordings, and that'll be um, one will be the first one DVD will be Neil Lozano himself, kind of giving a quick summary of all the five keys. So you kind of hear from the master, and so the so the meals will be silent in that way, um, which you can kind of listen. So it's kind of like the treat just kind of the retreat just kind of keeps going; um, it never stops. Um, I gave you a couple handouts. One we'll use, and the other one is gone silence. And silence is a big part of a retreat here, also, um, because God speaks in the silence. You know, uh, we know on Mount Horeb when Moses when, when uh, the prophet Elijah was. Was there he says he was it wasn't in the crushing wind or the fire or the rocks or the earthquake but it was in the still small voice and sometimes silence is needed for that so you've got a beautiful um little a little article um writings from mother Teresa about silence and the power of silence um so that's something to, to not be afraid of um but it is something that can allow god to speak allows the holy spirit to to reveal our hearts to us um so that's the the, the other bad news is that um because the homily, because this is, um, and I got to ask a question first. Um, is anybody not Catholic? I just want to be respectful in that sense to, to maybe explain little things a little different way. Okay, so it looks like nobody's hand raised up, so thank you. Now, the bad news is, is that the, because this is like a really Catholic retreat, um, in addition to an unbound conference to kind of woven together, there's a lot of Catholic stuff in here. Um, we're going to pray the rosary. We're going to probably do liturgy hours in the morning and evening and then tonight and night prayer. And I'll explain that to you if you've never been exposed to that before. Um, at the same time, the talks will be infused into the mass also on today, tomorrow, and Sunday. That means, guess what? It's a conference talk instead of a homily. And so it's really long, <laughs> okay? So that means the mass is really long. So just to give you, a, let you know that it's gonna be a long, that the, the talks will be infused into the mass as the homily, okay, for the seven talks. Um, so in order to have the masses, we, we put that inside of them, okay? And so there's where we start. Um, so I start a little bit. I said I'd talk about just to mention, introduce to you just in very simple ways. Um, the idea of offering mass this way has has anybody never been to a mass like this before? If you raise your hand, if you've never been to a mass like this, oh gosh, you guys are all pros at it. Then <laughs> I'll just give a little quick summary. Then um, the idea of the mass being offered this way is um, I like to use a, a couple little examples. Um, one is we help us understand what's happening in the mass before I'll use Eucharistic prayer number three. Um, Cause we, and, and in that prayer of number of years, a few years ago, I was praying the confessional before offering mass. I normally do this during Advent and last year did during Lent also, but normally during Advent, the coming of the Lord um, and we're facing East. So to say it's or orient him to the East is always facing Christ. Um, and what it was, was I noticed in Eucharistic prayer number three, that the word you, yours, yourself, which are referring to God, the father, are said 33 times, and then three times Lord and twice Father. That's not counting the consecration and not counting the preface. Okay, so 38 times in th- four and a half minutes, I make a direct personal reference, pronoun reference to God the Father. 30, 38 times in four and a half minutes. And normally we don't notice that. Why don't we notice that? Well, because God has wired us. He's wired us in a very specific way and, and I use the example of a little baby. How far can a little baby see when it's first born? About 18 inches from, a, from the arm to the mother's face. That's how far that God wired us. He wants us to see faces. This is really, really important. That's why it's kind of an, uh, wearing masks is kind of a difficult thing for us because we don't see faces. I, I teach in high school and the kids take off their masks sometimes. I see them, I don't even recognize them. <laughs> I'll be honest, I go, who, who are you? <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's an unfortunate reality, but that's how God wired us to see, to see faces. You know, that's how we connect with people to see a face. You know, we talk about the face of God mirrors the very person of God, but the person of God is acknowledged by his face, you know? Uh, and so that's how scripture relates to it so powerfully, but that's how we do too. You know, so what happens, we walk up somewhere, we notice the face, we look at the faces. That's how we talk to someone. So we're wired that way. So when I point, when I talk to you this way and I say, you, yours, yourself, you, yours, yourself, 33 times, it's hard for our brain 
not to think somehow, even though we know it's not referring to me, it's just, we're wired that way. You know, we're wired that way. We can't stop it. And so it's called cognitive dissonance where we have to have two things in our mind that are opposites at the same time that you're talking to me, but you're not talking to me. Okay. As a priest, I have to do that every single mass, every single mass. I have to, I am saying you, yours, yourself, and all of these things. And I have to say, no, I have to keep my brain, which is hard. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to God, the father. And so if you see a priest that doesn't look at you very often, that's why, because he's trying to focus on who he's praying to, which is God, the father. When I flip around, all that goes away. It does for you too. Because all of a sudden you start thinking, you, yours, yourself, Lord, Father, you, yours, yourself. Well, he's not talking to me. And it, it kind of releases a tension that we don't even notice is there. And so I just invite you to notice that. Become aware of it. That there's something very beautiful happening when we, when we go together following the priesthood of Jesus Christ and following offering Jesus Christ himself to the Father. There's just a very beautiful, simple movement that happens. I said this mass in about 350 high school kids, middle school kids, and some teacher who had been teaching for 44 years, and she was retiring that year. She came up to me after mass and said, Father, in tears, I haven't been able to focus on Jesus that much in decades. And, and, and I had a ninth grade girl in my choir come up father, afterwards, Father, when I disturbed my last prayer, she said, Father, now I get the mass. I get the mass. So um, it's a beautiful opportunity if you haven't seen it before. Um, but I, I, it sounds like most of you have. And so um, I, I ask you just to allow yourself to hear the words and to just experience with the deeper reality of what the mass is. It's such a beautiful reality that sometimes we unconsciously can't quite connect with it as deeply as we wish. And I, I pray that you'll be able to connect with it a little deeper tonight or to, this weekend. Um, so sometimes it's, it's good for us to kind of understand why and what these means. You may have heard it, you may have not. Um, so I hope I haven't belabored it too much. Um, the, the beautiful thing then we, we will start with is, is what this talk is really is, is called um, deliverance is a good word, you know, and first of all, I'll start with um, uh, a little bit about, um, you know, just where, why me, so to say, why am I here? Why am I standing here talking to you about this stuff? Well, um, it began for me in 2014 in a very naive attempt to help someone who came to me for help. Um, but was deeply involved in demonic witchcraft, um, ended up being the recipient, I did, of, a, of, of a, a number of very, very intense curses and spells and attacks and demonic attacks. And, I, and I'll share a little more about that during the weekend. But that's where it started. And what, in my own floundering, trying to figure out what, what's happening here, God, what, what's going on with this stuff, I heard on the Catholic radio, Unbound Conference for Freedom in Christ and Deliverance. And someone said, I don't know, I have no clue what that is, but I think I'm going to go. And so I called up the day before it was, and I'm going, um, can I come? And they said, sure, come on over. And so we went to Omaha, and I went to Omaha and went to the first Unbound Conference in the area here. And uh, when I got there, I saw a bunch of nuns in my diocese there. I go, I know I'm in the right place now. The Marian sisters were there, the Christ King sisters were there, and I'm going, okay, this is okay, this might be a good thing. So I, I, I knew I was okay. And so, but that's where it began. I bought everything they had. I bought every book, every CD, every DVD. And I says, I got to go home and, and we're going to look at this, figure this out, you know. And so I had a chance to talk with Neil for just a few minutes. Um, but, but it was, it was, and I'll share with the more story later. I guess my, my path, um, it's been a tremendous blessing in my life. And because of that, um, um, as the story goes on that I was, um, some people kept calling me and calling me and calling me, wanting me to do this. And I said, okay, finally, I said, yes. And so that 2015 was the first year that we had a, we kind of stumbled through our own first retreat. Um, and, and that's where we began. And so that's, what we've been doing, um, every year for the last, um, six years then. And so, but my story is not your path. Okay. We all got a different path in life. Mine's maybe a little bumpy and a little, a little twisted, a little weird. Um, but, but that's just my path. Okay. Um, but yours is also your own path. You know, it's, it's all yours. And, and, but we all have our own trials and struggles and battles in life of, of, of who we are and what's happening. You know, I think we can see that in, in a very interesting way is in our, in our gospel, you know, um, you know, there's a lot of bad stuff going on here. You know, <laughs> there is great grudge. That means there's hatred, there's vengeance there's um there's there's you know condemnation there's all these different stuff working on on herodias and then working on her daughter and then then there's murder um there's a lot of bad stuff there you know a lot of bad stuff wrapping around john the baptist becomes a martyr for marriage you know if we think about that for the great dignity of marriage john the baptist i don't think he even he didn't talk about that before but i like to say it that way i think john the baptist was a martyr for marriage you know what 
because he stood up for what the truth and goodness and holiness of marriage. And, and he spoke the truth, which is the opposite of the lie. You know, the enemy is always a liar. So when we renounce things, as you probably read in Neil's book, we renounce the spirit or the lies, you know? And so there was a lie going on there, a lot of them that Herod held on to, Herodias held on to, and it was going on there, you know? And, but John the Baptist spoke the truth. And as we know, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. You know, as Catholics, we are like to kind of say that, you know, I'm kind of like a, if you've ever been on a tour bus, you know, you have the tour director up front who he kind of just talks about things as you go past him, because hopefully you'll be interested and in go see more later, you know, whether it be in Rome or anyplace else. I'm kind of like that. I'm going to talk about the different things and hopefully it'll help you kind of go deeper in yourself, uh, deeper in your own prayer, deeper in your own conversation with our Lord, deeper in your own study also is about some of these different things. They help you understand it and relate to it. You know, in a big way that deliverance is kind of the word before Catholics is kind of a bad name, bad word. We don't, we're kind of scared of it. We don't understand it. It's kind of a foreign thing to us. We don't really talk about deliverance or deliverance prayer or things like that. You know, um, I, I like to think of it kind of coming off Christmas, you know, um, think of that word as a little bit different, deliver. Um, you know, that's a good word, really, because it is. What happens when UPS comes up? or the Amazon truck comes up, or FedEx truck, they deliver something and it's good stuff, okay? It's good stuff. But also if it doesn't fit or if it doesn't work, guess what? They take away the bad stuff too. <laughs> the delivery truck takes the bad stuff away. And so we can see also in a very similar way that this is part of deliverance, you know, um, being delivered from, from something bad into something good, you know, that they deliver something good and we're set free from the bad. We give it to the truck, we give it to the UPS man and he takes it away. It's a great way to work. Um, um, and it's not very difficult. And neither is what we're dealing with here. As Catholics, we, do, we see maybe in movies and we kind of see scary things in movies. And that's, that's not what it's all about. Um, it's something very, very different, very beautiful in what God has been doing. It's really a big part of our life. And we already even have it. You know, it's really taking hold of the freedom, deliverances of, that God has given you in his kingdom. You know, it's taking hold of the freedom that you already have. Um, and may not be aware of it. You know, Neil shares a story, a beautiful story of, um, of a young Rwandan woman um, who the enemy had, had really what the enemy had stolen from her. Um, you know, it was during the time when the, uh, um, the, the persecution and, and, the, and the many, many people be, be, were murdered there, um, but she hid in a forest and she returned still in fear. Um, you know, all her family, I believe, was, had, been, had been probably massacred, you know, and she was in college at this time. And, and one thing was happening is that she had this, she held on this lies, um, this, this incredible lie that she didn't want to even look at herself, you know, um, that she was ugly. Uh, and, and, and this, this, but who knows what else is all behind it, what had happened to her. You know, we don't, we can't even imagine probably, <clears throat> but she, all she had was a little tiny sliver of a mirror. And so when she would, she would, she would be maybe taking, putting on, uh, her makeup or hair or something. She just look at one little piece of her face. That's all she ever looked at. And this was, she was in college already. You know, this happened when she was many years younger. You know, she avoided the mirror at, at the end of the hallway is this great big mirror. And she never looked at it when she walked past the hallway, uh, never looked, you know, and deliverance is really a freedom to see ourselves as God sees us, as God sees us. You know, one day she, um, after the Unbound Conference, um, she had gone, she had been experienced that, that new freedom, and she walked into the hallway and she just stood there and looked at herself for the first time. And she went just aghast and she says, I'm beautiful. You know, she, for the first time in her life, she began to see herself really as God sees her. And that's deliverance. Deliverance is really in that, in that to begin seeing ourselves the way God sees us. You know, it's being set free from the bondage of believing a lie to see ourselves in the really in, as, as Christ, God sees us in Christ, that we are free, that we are beautiful. <clears throat> it's a good word, deliverance is. <clears throat> the trials of our life kind of show us our hearts, you know. Um, you probably had many things happen this, this week to come in here. You probably had struggles and trials and different kinds and probably thought about not even coming. You know, it's very possible. It happens to many, to many different people. Or it may have been just a grace-filled week that you just go, wow, it's like going down the slide, you know, just like floated right in. 
You know, it, it can be either way, you know, it, it happens both ways. Um, but, it, but it also is that reality, those struggles and trials sometimes show us what's really that the enemy doesn't want you to come to get this freedom. You know, that's one thing for sure. Um, but also that it can show us what's in our heart, you know, that there's a lot of stuff in our own hearts. And sometimes that struggle and trial, even to get here, reveals that to us also. <clears throat> we think about God and his goodness and his desire to save and heal us. You know, deliverance is moving into a new kingdom, you know. Um, at baptism, you moved into the kingdom of God. You became a member of his, his family, you know, and so you had the rights of his kingdom. You know, that's what happened at baptism. You became a child of God. That means you're part of the kingdom of God. You have the rights of his kingdom, which is freedom, which is light and truth and, and peace and happiness. You know, these became your rightful inheritance. It's moving out of something into something, you know, moving from a place of believing a lie and seeing yourself the way to see where the God sees us, you know, uh, it's moving to a better place, um, a safer place, a safer place. You know, uh, I remember a person who shared with me one time, they spoke with a counselor and the counselor brought up the word um, safe, just kind of said it in a, in, a, in a conversation and they began to literally weep. They had no idea why. They said the counselor said it again, and all of a sudden they just they said the word safety or safe or something, and they just literally began to they had, couldn't control it, and, and it was a sign of the great trauma in their life. That just hearing the word safe, and safety, really brought them to tears, you know. And this is what where deliverance is needed. You know, we don't even realize that sometimes how much pain and how much stress and how much burden we carry in our lives that God wants to set us free from. And so, you know, the reality of not seeing ourselves um, uh, the way that God sees us, you know, but deliverance is something very deep in sacred scripture. You know, it's part of Israel's history. It's part of our identity. It's part of our history. You know, the Israelites were slaves, yet they understood their identity as God's children, and they expected him to save them and, and to take care of them. They were, they waited for 400 years in Egypt to be set free, you know, um, it's really, it's a powerful moment because they were set free, set free from slavery, from Egypt, before God ever gave them the commandments. I never noticed that. You know, last time I gave this talk, I was looking at this, and I'm going, wow, you know what? They were set free before their God even told them what to do and how to live. There's God's goodness. We need to be set free sometime so that we can live the way God wants us to live. The freedom comes first. You know, and we're struggling maybe to live that way or to set peace and because we, we're still bound up. We're still slaves in a sense. You know, God delivers his people to that freedom. Exodus chapter 13, verse 8 to 10 says, On that day you will explain to your son, this is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. It will be like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead so that the teaching of the Lord will be on your lips with a strong right hand. And the Lord brought you out of Egypt. You will keep this statute as at appointed time from year to year. So that was when God told him to, to have the Passover meal. And he says, well, what, what will the children say? He says, this is what you tell them because this is what God has done. He has set us free. You know, it's Jesus' history as a Jew, you know, and it's, and it's something part of our story too. We are delivered from darkness to light. You know, Isaiah chapter 60 says, through darkness covers the earth and thick clouds of peoples. Upon you, the Lord will dawn and over you, his glory will be seen. You know, First John uh, chapter five, verse 19, the idea of Satan's kingdom is being taken away for God's kingdom. You know, in, the, in that verse, John writes, we know that we belong to God and the whole world is under the power of the evil one. You know, what I, what I like, really like is, is uh, Acts 26, verse 18. And this is the story of Paul's conversion, you know, and, and Paul speaks about what God tells him. Um, and God tells him something very profound. You know, verse, starting at verse 16, but rise, God says to Paul, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose. So God tells him why he even appears to him. He says, um, to appoint you to serve and bear witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people of the, and from the Gentiles to whom I send you to open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You know, that was the mission of Paul, was to reveal the light to us 
and help us turn from light, from the darkness to the light. You know, and what a great, great, powerful gift. This idea of being bondage and coming to freedom, Jesus talks about in 1 John 3, whoever sins belongs to the devil because the devil has sinned from the beginning. Indeed, the son of God was revealed to destroy the works of the devil. This is why Jesus came, is destroy Satan's kingdom, destroy the power he had in the world. Remember when Satan was, was thrown out of heaven, where did, he, where did he get thrown to? Down here. Remember before Jesus is going to the cross, he says, he says the, 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 the enemy or the, 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 the ruler of this world is coming. You know, um, um, so this is, this is where Christ comes in to destroy um, the bondage and to set us free. In John 8, 36, a slave does not remain in a household forever, but a son always remains. So if the son sets you free, you will truly be free. And that's what Jesus Christ wants to set us free. And, you know, there's more complete understanding of deliverance kind of involves knowing that deliverance is not exorcism. That's where we have to kind of start out. It's not driving out demons, okay? It's not an exorcism is a right of the Catholic Church given by a priest who has the author, uh, authorization of the bishop. It is prayers and blessings that make it more painful for the demon to stay than to remain. Um, that's kind of what exorcism is not. Um, it's not dealing with the struggles of everyday life. It's something that has been deeply embedded, but it, this is not exorcism. Okay. This is not a public right of the church. It's actually something that is, is we have power by our very baptism. And I'll talk about that in more detail in a later talk. There's a very big difference between exorcism and non-confrontational deliverance. That's what this is called. Non-confrontational deliverance. Exorcism is confrontation. It's like, okay, we're going to battle. We're going to duke it out. Non-confrontational saying says, God, you take care of it. I'm not in the battle. You just do it. You know, take care of things. Um, that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and maybe a silly example might be kind of think of this like a cartoon, perhaps, you know, uh, example, maybe it's a, imagine a little child who hates to go to the dentist, maybe me. Um, and, and would kick and scream and violently hold on to anything to take, be taken care out of the house. You know, just, I'm not going. You can almost imagine that little scene of somebody that I want to go to the dentist and screaming and hold on to everything possible. The door, the railing, the table, the chair, the parent, um, until you have to pry their little hands off to whatever they're holding on to forcefully to take them to the dentist. Okay. The other option would be given the same petulant child to simply remove whatever he might be holding on to. Take the door off the hinges. Take the railing away. Nothing to grab onto. Can't hold on anymore. That's kind of what unbound is. It's taking away whatever the enemy is holding on to in our hearts. And it's removing that. Deliverance is a transfer from one kingdom to another. Deliverance includes freedom from the influence of evil spirits. Freedom from the influence. Evil spirits are behind many of our negative emotions passions, um, that because of our weakness, we let some of these spirits kind of leak into our lives um, through the wound that caused a tear in our lives. There's always a wound, and the enemy kind of likes to leak into that. There's an example I use that I think the Holy Spirit must have gave me because it's too simple for me to figure out. But, okay, we all remember your kids and yourself. Okay, you were, you were at home, and maybe you were growing up, and you are riding your bike or your skateboard or whatever it is, and you wiped out. And you got your hand ground in the gravel, the dirt, or the concrete, whatever it is. You got dirt stuck in your hand and, and gravel for your kids, okay? And what, is, what, the, what do we do? We go to mom, oh, my hand, ouch. You know, what does mom start to do? Okay, you take out the dirt. You clean it out, right? You clean out the wound. And then what do you do? What after that? Anybody? Wash it, right? right? Wash it out. Then what do you do? What do you do before bandaging? Now, when I was a kid, we had this evil stuff called iodine and methylate, which, which felt worse than, the, worse than the wound, actually. But what do you put on now? Antibiotic, neosporin, whatever you call it, okay? Yeah, so you put that on there. Why do you put that stuff on? What does it do? Did I hear something about bacteria? Kills, kills bacteria. There we go. Kills bacteria. Right. Well, that means you could have washed the wound out, had it all nice and clean, slapped a batting on it, but if it still had bacteria in it, what would happen to it? It doesn't heal. It gets infected. Okay? Body has to fight harder at it. Okay? Every single one of us have a soul. 
And our souls are about a thousand or maybe a hundred thousand times more sensitive than our hands are. And we get wounded. We get wounded. We get wounds with that. We got the stuff stuck in the wounds. You know, what do we do? You know, after we, have, we have to take the dirt out. We have to take the rocks out. That's called forgiveness. That's called forgiveness. Takes the wounds and cleans the wound out. Forgiveness does that. But then we still got that bacteria to take care of. And that's what the renunciation does. And I call it spiritual bacteria. The stuff that keeps sticks. In it. We can, have, we can for, have forgiven someone. We clean the wound out. But it still doesn't heal. Because there's that spiritual bacteria sticking around in there. Which is like the spirit of resentment. The spirit of anger. The spirit of bitterness. The spirit of condemnation. The spirit of fear. And they're still sticking in that wound. And they keep poking it. What happens when you keep poking a wound? They don't heal. And so they keep poking that wound every chance they get. So it won't heal. And so that's what this is really about. It's really about just cleaning out the wounds of our life by forgiving, um, then renouncing the spiritual bacteria that may be stuck in our lives so that the wounds can heal. Will the wounds be healed instantly? Maybe, maybe not. Depends on how deep they are just like any wound. But that's really what's happening with this. That's really what's going on. Um, it's just a little analogy that I think, for me, helps understand and explain a little more about what this is all about. You know, um, there's different kinds of, uh, kind of, for example, a hurt or a wound can make us angry. You know, there's righteous anger, unrighteous anger, you know. Um, um, but a number of emotions can be connected and they kind of grow, you know, bitterness, resentment, revenge, hatred, condemnation, self-pity, you know, all these things. But deliverance does not focus on the devil or the works of the devil, okay? Um, but it really, it says, it's, it's to move us to a safer place. And we have to see in the bigger context. You know, often we need to unlearn some old practices, perhaps, and focus on what helps us get there. You know, um, you know so Jesus helps us learn how to listen to those things also. You know, I remember um, what deliverance what it looks like. I was asking when it was first all started. I remember I called Neil and asked him to give me. He gave me a call back. I was walking through Walmart at the time, and he calls me and he, he asked, "Well, doesn't people say that this is like confession, really?" And he goes, "No, no." He says, "This is really evangelization. It's about inviting Jesus into the darkest part of our life and finding healing there. You know, it's about setting free and those things that have happened in our life, what's happened to us." You know, um, I like to share also is that, you know, unbound is, is, is a little bit like um, the opposite of confession. Okay. In confession, it's like a, like a zig, think of my fingers, like a, like a, like a puzzle, a puzzle piece. Okay. And what happens is, is that, um, you know, in a puzzle piece, for example, um, in the confession, we go in, we ask, we say what we've done wrong and we ask for forgiveness. Okay. What we've done wrong and we ask for forgiveness. Unbound's like the other side is where we come in and we say, what's been bad done to us? And we give forgiveness. Same two things, just different direction. We don't have time for that in confession because um, we only got a few minutes. But we always, but we never, whoever it's, but it's just the other side. Saying what's been bad done to me as opposed to the bad I've done. And instead of asking for forgiveness, it's giving forgiveness. And so um, those two analogies I like to use to kind of help us understand what's really happening, that it, deliverance is really about becoming free, being set free. Um, and that's just a beautiful gift. You know, there's a, there's a powerful way of, 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 of looking at that and, and helping us go forward, realizing that, you know what, deliverance is really part of our lives. It's part of our lives all the time. You know, as Catholic Christians, we pray for deliverance daily. Our Father who art in heaven, what's the last words? Deliver us from evil. That's a deliverance prayer. You know, St. Michael Archangel, deliver us prayer. You know, the Anima Christi is considered a deliverance prayer. Deliver us from, from the evil. In other words, in there. The Mass, our Father's there, is setting us free from what's Satan's power. It's deliverance. The Rosary, all the time you say the Our, our Father. You know, so, the, so we have deliverance woven deeply into our spiritual life already if we're praying, you know, and that's the, that's the beauty of, we, we don't even realize how much incredible things are going on in our just average Catholic life. You know, just the sacraments and our prayers, 
um, we've got so much. We're just, we're like, we're like loaded already. We've got so much happening. You know, you know, and when Neil went to Kenya to train some leaders there, you know, he, uh, um, they were shocked because he says, I mean, we don't have to jump up and down, scream and holler. He says, this is, this is, they couldn't understand it, but it was so was calm and so non-confrontational that they, they said, yeah, we can do this. Um, because when they had deliverance before, it was just, it was really a ruckus, you know. Um, but this was something profoundly different and profoundly powerful because it's so important, so deeply woven into just Jesus, what he does. You know, um, they were all visibly relieved because they had the five keys, the power that they had to set people free. Deliverance is, is, is in the name of Jesus Christ because only Jesus really can do this. You know, um, after my time with the, I, ha, I went to see a priest I'd met on a 30 day retreat named Monsignor John Essef. He's one of the more renowned uh, exorcists in the country. He'd been a spirit director from Mother Teresa for a while. Um, and, he, and, he, and he's a pretty, pretty straight to the point kind of guy, you know? And uh, I, he says, you try to help kindness, you know, practice and powerful player, but there's big problems. He's, he says, I was ignorant, well-meaning, but very naive. You know, he said, bluntly, you can do nothing for yourself or anybody else. That's what he told me. After I've been trying to help this person who ended up cursing me, you can do nothing by yourself um, or anybody else. Only Jesus can. He's the only one who can do this stuff. Only he can. It's not me. It's not the people on your team that prays with you. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can heal you. Only Jesus can set you free. Only Jesus can protect me. Only Jesus can show me the way. You know, only he can. You know, and I'll be, this is just my own opinion, but I think this whole COVID thing um, maybe has, you have to always see God bring good out of evil. What's the good he's trying to bring out of this whole thing? You know, just because we didn't go to church, does that mean Jesus left us? No. He was even closer than they ever realized. Maybe that's what he was trying to get us to do is just recognize that we have to focus on him, that he's the one we have to be focused on. Even if we can't go to church, even if we can't receive the sacraments, that Jesus Christ is God. He is our savior. He is the one who says, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the world and count on that and lean into that. Maybe that's what he was trying to get us to do to realize that he is with us always and that we can count on him always, and that he will never leave us ever. Maybe that's what he was inviting us to do in a bigger way. And maybe we have, I, I think many people have. I shared with a person one time, um, uh, my bookkeeper, I think it was, I says, you know, I think people, I think God just wants to recognize um, our hunger for him. And she started weeping. She said, I didn't even know I had a hunger for Jesus. It wasn't until this stuff happened that she began to realize how much of a hunger she had in her heart. And maybe that's where God wants us, is to begin realizing the hunger that he has, that we have for him. You know, it leads to evangelization because what happens after we get freedom? We can't stop talking about it, you know? That's the great thing about it, is that when we experience it to any level, we start saying, wow, that was pretty incredible. I wanna tell somebody. You know, I remember I went to a missionary conference one time and uh, the nun who was given a talk quoted some author who said, you know, that the gospel was first gossiped. They were at the bread stores. Hey, you know what that Jesus guy did? Man, he raised that person from the dead. Maybe they're out buying some lamb or something. They says, yeah, Jesus, he just, he said he's a lamb of God and he just, he rose from the dead. You know, they talked about him. You know, it's, it's like the name that shall not be spoken sometimes. For us Catholics, we, we need to get used to saying, hey, let's talk about him. Let's bring his name up. You know, I like to challenge people every few times a year. I challenge them and throw them from the pulpit and say, I, I dare you to talk about Jesus this week, to bring him up in a conversation at home or at work or someplace and just see what happens. You know, it's kind of a scary thing, but, uh, you know, it, it has a lot of great blessings to it. You know, it really is we're focusing on the truth. Uh, the, the truth is that, you know, the devil's schemes and tactics are what we're looking at. What are his schemes and tactics? And that's what we're really moving to take care of. The teaching of Abound is focused on how to recognize the devil's schemes and, and take your stand against them. You know, take your stand against them. That's what it's looking at. 
Um, and that's a, that's, that's a tremendous gift, you know? And so we, he likes to distort the truth. He likes to hide sin from our awareness. He likes to block our ability to know our savior. That's his game. That's his game. So we got to get to know the plays. Just like the Super Bowl is coming up, you better bet that they're studying the other team's plays. That's how you do it. If you want to be t- defend against an enemy, you got to figure out their game. You got to figure out their schemes, blocking schemes, running schemes, passing schemes for the big game. And you can't just think it's going to happen. So we, that's what we do. We have to figure out. This is kind of about figuring out his schemes. That's what we'll be talking about throughout this weekend also. You know, so the prayer basically targets the enemy's strategies, and we so we focus on them, saying this is where the enemy's working, and so this is where we're gonna we're gonna stand fast, and so it, it's um, um we don't focus on the devil or confronting him at all. You know, it's really about just um those 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 schemes that he has that we're gonna try and ask Jesus to block. We're gonna put him in the center. We're gonna make him the one who carries the ball, and he's the one who's gonna take their take control of the game, and that's where we want to live at. Um, and, but it also involves doing our part. You know, God wants us to decide for it. Do we really want to be free? You know, that's the question we have to ask ourselves. Do we really want to be free? Because sometimes we like our stuff. We've had it for so long. We maybe lived with it for all our life, perhaps, and we can't find it hard to get rid of. The first thing to decide is that you want to be free. We need his grace to surrender to him. So we can beg him, Jesus, give me the grace to desire freedom. Jesus, give me the grace to desire you above all else. And ask him for those things. Ask him for those things. You know, on your sheet there, there is, a, there is the prayer, a little prayer of um, the, uh, um, only Jesus can. I'm going to say a little closing prayer here. Then we're going to use that for our offertory prayer or for our intercession prayers. Lord, I want to be free. Okay, this is kind of how we want to pray. Lord, I want to be free. I give you my whole life. I surrender it all to you. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I don't want to hold on to my small bondages or my big ones. I want to give them to you. Help me, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Let my heart be pleasing to you. Amen. Please stand. And you got the the prayer only Jesus can. We're going to pray that now. Dear Lord, we come to you with these prayers. We come to you asking for these many, many graces that we know that you have great desire to give us. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for giving us these things because we are asking you in your goodness. So as we, I'll say the first part and you can say the second part. Only Jesus can. 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 Dear Lord Jesus, you are the source of all goodness. We just thank you now, Lord. We thank you for all that you want to give us. We thank you for all you're going to do in our lives, either either visibly and powerfully or even subtly and, and under not even us being aware of it. We thank you, Lord. We praise you today as we ask all this through Christ our Lord. That little litany of prayer was kind of, we had a meeting after we first started with the Unbound. We just says, okay, what does he do? And we just, that was a brainstorm of just everybody in the meeting. That's where it came from.
Blessed, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Through the earth and work of human hands, it will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God, of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be accepted to God, the Almighty Father. May the offerings we bring in celebration of blessed St. Agatha win your gracious acceptance, O Lord, we pray, just as a struggle of her suffering and passion were pleasing to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Amen. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, for the blood of your blessed martyr, St. Agatha, poured out like Christ to glorify by your name, shows forth your marvelous works by which in our weakness you perfect your power, and on the feeble bestow strength to bear you witness through Christ our Lord. And so at the powers of heaven we worship you constantly on earth, and before your majesty without end we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you gave life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread. And giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of faith. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself so that we grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Agatha, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and James, our Bishop, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life. Give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command and for my divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but in the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your Lamb of God, you take Amen. away the sins of the world. In the name of the Lord, you can your left as receive it. God, you take away the sins of the world. And his peace. Either receive your bread, love as you pass back, and enjoy that foundation. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I'm not worthy. You should enter under my roof. But only say the word, and my soul shall be healed.
Let us pray. O God, who bestowed on blessed St. Agatha a crown among the saints for her twofold triumph of virginity and martyrdom, grant, we pray, through the power of this sacrament, that bravely overcoming every evil, we may attain the glory of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. We are protection against the wickedness and snares the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. To thou, o Prince, the heavenly host, the divine power of God, thrust into hell all the evil spirits. Proud about the world, seeking the souls.